So welcome back, folks. So if you weren't in our last session, what we're doing all the afternoon sessions is going to welcome our speakers to the non-existent stage with a standing ovation, please. Uh, so um, uh, if you'd like to give it up for our next speaker, who's a very good friend of mine, and there isn't many people in the world who know more about open source and community than Dawn Foster. So please, standing ovation. <laughs> like a rock star and get a standing ovation and a fabulous introduction. Uh, so welcome to my talk, everyone. Uh, the slides are already uploaded both on my website, which you can find linked here, Fast Wonder Blog. They're also on the Cloud Native Rejects site as well. I wanted to just quickly thank the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation for funding the Chaos Data Science Initiative, um, so basically paying for my work along with some other chaos initiatives and some funding from the Linux Foundation and the Ford Foundation that support the work we do in the chaos project. Uh, I have been in the technology industry for over 20 years, mostly working on open source projects with a focus on community strategy, metrics, and growing your contributor base. And I can tell you that it's really hard to build a strong open source community for a project. Most of us struggle with finding enough humans to sustain our projects. So let's start by talking more about the problem and why it can be so hard to achieve sustainable contributor growth for open source projects. As I said, the problem is hard. I like to start this presentation with a uh, Star Trek quote. So an alien life form on Star Trek The Next Generation once described humans as ugly bags of mostly water. Now, I, I don't think we're ugly, so they got that part wrong, but, but we're pretty squishy, right? And not just in the physical sense, we can be unpredictable and irrational, especially when we're stressed out, overworked, or burnt out. And the reality is that we aren't robots, right? Or mindless automatons. Humans have feelings. We have bad days. We have other commitments and loads of personal challenges in our own lives that are often invisible to other contributors and they can get in the way of our contributions to open source projects. But you can't have an open source project without having those human beings to maintain it. So you need to be able to encourage people to participate in ways that are sustainable over the long term, both for the project and for those individuals. And it helps to be proactive and ask people to participate in specific ways and in, in the ways that match the work that you need to do within your project. Many projects struggle to find people who will actively participate in their projects and continue to participate over the long term. If it was easy, you'd already have all the people you needed to maintain your project, and you wouldn't be here watching this talk. We're in a situation now where there are a lot of open source projects and just not enough contributors. Maintainers are burning out, and they're in desperate need of help. So sometimes it can be really difficult to get people to contribute to your project. And unfortunately, there is no magic or one-size-fits-all solution. But throughout this talk, I'll focus on some things you can do to increase the chances of successfully building a community and growing contributors for your project. Open source project maintainers are also squishy humans with feelings and bad days. Maintaining an open source project is hard work that often extends out over many, many years. And maintainer burnout is common in open source projects. Even the really big, successful open source projects like Kubernetes struggle with maintainer burnout and growing the contributor community. It can be hard for already overworked maintainers to balance the day-to-day -day work required to keep the project running while also investing in additional activity to increase future community sustainability. This creates a vicious cycle where maintainers don't have enough time to onboard contributors, leading to fewer contributors, which leads back to no time to onboard new contributors. And while it takes a bit more time up front, if you can invest some time in activities that will help you onboard some new humans, like onboarding documentation, you can increase the chances that you'll break out of this vicious cycle. All right, now that we've talked about the factors that can impact contributor growth and why it can be so challenging, I'm going to shift into talking to, about some strategies for growing your contributor base using contributor ladders, for example, to help find more humans who can grow into leadership positions. And then finally, I'll talk about some metrics you can use to measure project sustainability, along with some resources and final thoughts. 
As promised, let's start by talking about developing and executing on a long-term contributor growth strategy, including motivation, governance, new contributor onboarding, mentoring, and leadership. People's motivations for contributing to your project vary widely. Some people are contributing as a part of their job, while others might contribute to gain experience or maybe learn about a particular language or technology. You don't actually have any control over what originally motivated these people to show up, but there are some things you can do to motivate them to stick around, regardless of why they showed up in the first place. Clear communication and reducing friction are key to helping people stick around. And I'll talk more in upcoming slides about the importance of explicit and clearly communicated governance, along with solid onboarding docs and fostering a welcoming and inclusive community. There are also other things you can do to motivate people to contribute. Having good first issues or help wanted labels are excellent places to start because these help the humans find something that they can work on while they learn more about your project. Good first issues should be targeted as something simple that a brand new contributor could pick up and complete in a short amount of time to help them learn more about the contributor contribution process. Help wanted labels can be for issues that maybe are a little more involved so the people who've already started to contribute can find something else to work on. But good first issues and help wanted labels are passive requests for help. So I encourage maintainers to be proactive and specific about ways that people can help. Asking someone specific to review a PR or answer a question from a user demonstrates that you recognize their unique expertise and want their help. This is what motivated me to start contributing to tag contributor strategy within the CNCF. Paris Pittman asked me to write a guide for the tag about measuring project health, a topic that admittedly I am pretty passionate about, and it made me feel good, right, that she recognized my expertise and wanted my help. Knowing that we're wanted and appreciated makes us squishy humans feel good, which can be a strong motivator to contribute to an open source project or to continue contributing. A lot of people like to hate on governance. Just extra paperwork, it's busy work, it's politicking, that gets in the way of doing the real work on the project. Um, but this isn't true of good governance, which is really just about setting expectations and getting all of the various humans within your community collaborating together. Ultimately, the focus of open source project governance is on people, the roles we play, our responsibilities, how we make decisions, and what we should expect from each other as part of participating in the community. The goal should be to make the processes for participating as obvious as possible, even for people who are brand new to the community. Having clear rules about how collaboration occurs, how decisions are made, what types of contributions are in or out of scope, helps community members make contributions that are likely to be accepted and embraced by the project. This helps avoid wasting maintainers' time with contributions that just aren't aligned with the project. A healthy project with clear governance makes the humans happy and helps set your project up for future growth and long-term success. Another aspect of governance is about making it easier to move people into areas of increasing responsibility to help reduce the load on the existing maintainers. Now we'll talk more about this later in the section on um, contributor ladders and leadership. The good news is that you don't have to start from scratch. We have some really good templates with instructions that we've developed for the CNCF, but that apply to most projects to help you quickly and easily build out some basic <coughs> governance for your project. Now, I suspect that some of you are still thinking you don't really need to spend time on governance, um, but think about this from the perspective of the new contributor. It's much more difficult to participate in a community if you don't know anything about the role you might play, the expectations, the key players, or the rules for participating. Explicit documented governance gives both new and existing contributors a clear path to guide them through your project. Spending a bit of time documenting governance up front can save you time later with fewer questions about how things work, and it gives you a document that you can point the other humans to if they have questions. When I start contributing to a new open source project, I want to know how decisions are made, who makes those decisions, and where the discussions about the decisions happen which helps me understand whether the decisions are made fairly in the open based on solid information with the involvement of people with the expertise to make those decisions 
And I also want to be able to see a clear path into leadership for me or for my colleagues if we decide to embrace the project over the long term. The bottom line is that if the processes for collaboration and decision making are not clearly documented as part of project governance, this introduces a lot of uncertainty into the mix. And uncertainty makes the humans nervous. It increases the barrier to contribution while also jeopardizing the health and viability of the project. Good documentation is how we scale the things that take up precious time for the already overworked human beings. Like answering the same onboarding questions over and over and over. I see, I see so many open source projects with contributing guides that don't actually provide much or frankly any useful information. At a minimum, a new contributor needs to understand how to spin up an environment where they can do their development, the expectations for testing and how to run tests, any processes or other expectations you might have for pull requests, and instructions for other requirements like a contributor license agreement or developer certificate of origin, for example. If this is all well documented, new contributors can get started with a minimal amount of help from existing maintainers which can save you a lot of time in the long run. When a project doesn't have good onboarding docs, those squishy, burnt out maintainers get frustrated by the amount of time they spend on new contributor questions, which can make it hard for new contributors to feel welcome and take a long time for them to become productive. And this is how the humans get discouraged and drift away from your project. This doesn't mean that you need to spend days and weeks writing the perfect onboarding documentation Anything is better than nothing, and if you start with a few things that will help people get started quickly, new contributors can actually help make the onboarding documents better by adding more details and additional instructions for the things that they found confusing or that they struggled with. Your project should be designed to keep diversity, equity, and inclusion top of mind, building a diverse community where all of the humans feel welcome and included doesn't just happen. It requires putting work and thought into it. But this is time well spent, right? Providing an environment where everyone, including people from marginalized populations, feel safe is the first step toward building a diverse community around your project. Ideally, having programs that give people opportunities for shadowing, mentoring, and sponsoring new potential leaders can help grow a diverse set of people into leaders within the project. The Kubernetes Contributor Experience SIG is a great place to see some examples of how to implement programs for things like shadowing and mentoring. Projects that make a concerted effort to bring in new people from a variety of backgrounds and have programs in place to help them grow into leadership positions are more likely to benefit from increased innovation and have a healthier community. By having a diverse and welcoming community, you also have the advantage of getting the humans who might not feel welcome in some other projects. Now this is still kind of part of the strategy section, but it's important enough to call out separately with its own section, since moving new humans into leadership positions is a key part of growing your contributor base and scaling your project. And I'll talk more about this in the context of contributor ladders, which is a good way to do this. Defining the roles and responsibilities for contributors, reviewers, maintainers, and other roles can help with recruiting new humans into these roles. It can help to think about this as a ladder where contributors can climb up to become reviewers, those reviewers can become maintainers. What's important is to document it and make sure that people understand how they can climb that ladder and gain more experience within your project. A contributor ladder usually outlines different contributor roles within the project, along with the responsibilities and the privileges that come with them. Community members generally start at the first levels of the ladder and then advance up it as their involvement in the project grows. For each rung of the ladder, you can define responsibilities, which are the things that a contributor is expected to do. Requirements are the qualifications that a person needs um, to meet to be in that role. And privileges are the things that a contributor on that ladder, that level, are entitled to. And all of this helps set expectations for the roles and encourages people to think about how they might take on areas of increasing responsibility within the project. As you get more of the humans moving into maintainer roles, you can reduce the load of the existing maintainers. And the good news is that like with some of the other things, there is a template you can use to avoid building this from scratch. Now, it was modeled after Kubernetes, so it probably has more roles than most projects need. 
Uh, so it's usually simplified and customized for what you need for your project. Project leadership is one of the key elements of good governance. And this is how you scale your project. So you should have clear documentation about your leadership. For small projects, maybe you just need a list of maintainers that indicates which of the humans are responsible for various areas within the project. But the key is to spend some time thinking about this as you document your governance and contributor ladder so that you can bring new humans into leadership positions and reduce the load on the existing maintainers to help scale your project by growing your contributor base. Now, there are quite a few different options for selecting leaders as part of defining your governance. And the ideal is to have a process that provides a fair and level playing field that defines how contributors become leaders. This should be documented, again, so that all participants can clearly understand the criteria and the process for moving into those leadership positions. Some of the bigger projects, like Kubernetes, Knative, have an election process, at least for the top levels of leadership, like a steering committee. But only the biggest projects actually need something that complicated. Most projects have a really simple process where the existing leaders get to select the new ones. For example, new maintainers are often nominated by existing maintainers and approved, maybe after a certain number of maintainers agree, or maybe there's a vote. And there are a bunch of different options for selecting leaders. I won't cover them here, but there is an entire document devoted to those options on the next slide, or sorry, on the, the link on the slide. Now, mentoring takes a bit more time, but it's a really good way to help existing contributors become even better with an eye toward moving them into leadership positions. For busy maintainers, one good approach is to focus on mentoring some of the humans who've already been around for a while and are unlikely to disappear to help them learn to do some more complex, time-consuming tasks. Now, like with many things, mentoring is not something that has to be all or nothing. And you can, you can kind of time box it to whatever amount of time you can fit into your schedule. Even spending an hour a month or an hour a week to help someone quickly become productive in your project can be time well spent if that person can take on a few tasks to reduce your load as a maintainer. You can even structure this as shadowing to allow them to watch and learn while you do some maintainer tasks that you needed to do anyway. And if you focus this on helping another human learn to do something that can free up your time later, then this will be time well spent. Humans like to think of ourselves as irreplaceable. But we are not. We move on to other jobs. We burn out. We retire. And let's face it, humans are mortal and we do not live forever. You should think about what you might want to do next and how you can prepare someone else to take over after you move on. I encourage projects to have an option for people to move to emeritus roles, which recognizes the hard work that you've put into a project and gives others a point of contact if they have questions about what came before, while also allowing you to step away from some of the day-to-day -day responsibilities on the project. And I encourage you to think of stepping into an emeritus role as a successful way of handing your duties off to the next generation of maintainers for a project. The strategic part of all of this comes in thinking about where your time would be best spent. I've given you a lot of suggestions so far in the presentation, and you should not try to do everything at once. So I recommend you think strategically about where you should start. If you know you've had people interested in contributing, but then they give up when they couldn't get started, maybe you should start with onboarding docs. If you have a lot of casual contributors, maybe you focus on the contributor ladder and governance to help people um, to help move some of those other humans up to take on more responsibility and eventually move into leadership positions. Another way to free up some time for maintainers and break out of the vicious cycle that I talked about earlier is by getting help with different types of contributions that take up valuable time and are required to make an open source project successful. Documentation, marketing, community management, and lots of other roles. For projects with really complex code bases, it can sometimes be easier to onboard people into these roles first to free up some time to onboard other contributors later. One way to figure out the best place to start is by using metrics to help find problem areas and figure out where you should be spending your time. Time is precious, so it's important to identify problem areas where you can focus on the right things while avoid wasting time on areas that are already working well. 
However, metrics do need to be interpreted in light of how you operate as a community and the other things that are happening in your project. There's no one-size-fits-all interpretation of metrics. So in this next section, I'll use some example graphs from DevStats to talk about some trends that might indicate how you can think about addressing potential issues. You should also have a look at that project health guide from Tag Contributor Strategy. Um, oh yeah, it is linked at the bottom there. Um, for more ideas about how to measure the health of your project. One key area to look at for your project is responsiveness. Projects that are responsive are more likely to retain both new and existing contributors. This graph helps you see if a project is keeping up with incoming pull requests. This is important for a couple of reasons. Old pull requests sometimes stay around for too long because maintainers don't want to tell someone that their pull request is just never going to be accepted. Often for very good reasons, right? Like architectural incompatibility or other conflicts with the direction of the project. But this leaves contributors hanging and unsure about why their request isn't being merged, which wastes people's time and reflects badly on the project. In this case, it might help to provide some training for maintainers about the importance of closing pull requests and how to do it with empathy and kindness toward the people who put in the work to contribute. If even good quality relevant pull requests aren't being merged in a reasonable amount of time, this can indicate that the project just doesn't have enough maintainers or that these maintainers don't have the bandwidth to keep up. After a while, uh, it becomes impractical, right, to merge old pull requests uh, because they're often just, they're gonna be too many merge conflicts if that pull request has been sitting around for months. So in this case, it's important to look at ways to bring more people into the project or to promote a few people to maintainers if you have existing contributors who are ready for that responsibility. Now this graph looks at time to first response to see if pull requests or issues are responded to by another human, excluding the bots, in a reasonable amount of time. Because a quick response can help you retain contributors who otherwise might become discouraged if they don't receive a timely response. In this case, the median is about 16 hours, which is pretty good. And this is important because people put a lot of work into a contribution and they're likely watching that PR and waiting to see how it's received. If it sits there with no response for days and weeks, people get discouraged and they feel like they're wasting their time. In this case, um, any response is, better, is likely better than no response. Even if the response is to thank them and give them maybe an idea of when to expect feedback, and again, if people aren't getting a timely response, it may be time to bring in more contributors or promote um, a few of those to become maintainers. Timely, thoughtful, and kind responses to contributors indicate that you appreciate their work. I also like to look at contributor risk for a project. This is often called the bus factor or lottery factor and can be used to think about what would happen to a project if a key contributor won the lottery and retired on a beach and never came back. Um, in the Cilium and Cloud Custodian examples on this slide, the project would likely be okay if a couple of people left because the work seems to be distributed among quite a few contributors. If you see that one or two people are making all of the contributions, then it's probably time to find a few more contributors and mentor them into maintainer roles to better distribute the workload and reduce the risk for the project. Another reason that I like this metric is that you can you can also use it to think about which up and coming contributors might be ready to move into maintainer roles or be a candidate for mentoring to move into a maintainer role later. Before I wrap up this talk, let me leave you with just a few resources that you might find useful. The CNCF Contributor Strategy Technical Advisory Group has a governance working group, a contributor growth working group, and we provide templates and guidance about contributor experience, sustainability, governance, and openness and help people develop strategies for maintaining healthy projects. We also have a contributor growth framework document that you might find useful. The Open Source Way Guidebook has loads of details about building and maintaining open source projects. Uh, the Chaos Project, where I work, has loads of metrics definitions and software that you can use to measure the health of your open source community. And these are all really great starting places for understanding how to grow your contributor community. Now I've mentioned the CNCF Contributor Strategy Technical Advisory Group and linked to our resources on a bunch of slides, but I wanted to put in a really quick recruiting plug because like with most open source projects, we are also looking for help. The resources and templates that I've linked to were all created by the humans behind the tag. And we can use your help to improve them and create new resources to help CNCF projects. 
So if you're passionate about contributor growth, governance, building community, and want to help CNCF projects improve in these areas, we'd love to have you join us to help us develop more resources and provide advice to projects. So let's wrap things up and I'll leave you with just a couple of final thoughts. Maintaining an open source project is so much work. And there are so many maintainers who are overworked, exhausted, and burning out. The best way to address this challenge is by finding more humans and growing your contributor base. But again, it's hard work. And it takes time away from the day-to-day -day activities now, which can be hard to justify, right, when you feel like you're barely keeping up as it is. In the longer term, spending at least a little time on things that can help you recruit and keep new contributors will be worth it. As I mentioned before, you don't need to do everything at once. Spending just a little time on something to grow your contributor base is a great way to start. So this is what I'm asking you to do. If you're a maintainer or even a regular contributor to an open source project, carve out one hour a week to improve your onboarding docs, your contributing guide, project governance, or maybe just spend that time helping another human learn to do something new. With that, thank you, and I'll open it up for questions. OK, questions for Dawn. Uh, Marginally quicker getting his hand up there. <laughs> Hi, Don. Thank you. Um, I have a question around the maintainers' engagement and PR reviews. Yeah. And can you, uh, you said like to do like a training to the maintainers so they can review. Do you have some ideas there? And a follow up question around that. If the project is open source and let's say it's CNCF, right? But still, mm -hmm. some companies are behind it and they're heavily influencing the, the project. Um, some PRs which are not coming from the company originates the project can be moved forward quickly than the, than the others. Um, how, do you have some ideas how to mitigate that thing? Because sometimes the company uh, priorities are higher and they're driven faster in the community and the community things are not that much of attention, <laughs> right? You know what I'm talking about. So can, can you, do you have some ideas how we can overcome this one? Because a lot of projects are facing these kind of issues. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I, I, so, so I think that it does take a deliberate effort, especially in some of those projects that have a lot of contributors from a single company. They really do need to make, make the effort to focus on some of those contributions that aren't necessarily coming from, from their company. Because the, the reality is that's, that's how you scale your project. You're not going to be able to you know, continue to keep putting more and more resources from your company into it, you know, in, in, into infinity, unless you're a very, very, very big company. And even in that case, probably not. So you really do need to, I think, make a concerted effort to, to make sure that people focus on some of those contributions that come from outside of your company. Does that answer your question? Uh, I would like to dig more. <laughs> What's that effort in, in particular? Like, because I'm, you know, I'm trying to manage two projects and I'm constantly trying to educate the maintainers they have to do that. Yeah. But that doesn't happen for many reasons. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so the, the what else I can do, right? That's, that's my, uh... Yeah, I mean I think I think what you have to do is to have to continue to to mentor some of those some of those maintainers. And in, in some cases, especially when it's like a CNCF project, um, you do really need to stress that this is no longer a company initiative, that this this really is is bigger than the company. And they need to treat it that way. And that can be, those can be hard discussions to have with maintainers, for sure. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Um, thanks for the yeah. talk. Uh, just a quick question. I'm a reviewer for ATCD, and one of the areas where uh, I have a difference of opinion currently with um, some of the maintainers is around issues going stale and PRs going stale. Yeah. Um, I, I think we should be trying to actively close down and respond to some of those and, and kind of triage those and mm -hmm. some of the... The tech leads and maintainers kind of think that it's okay just to let them go stale and, and kind of not respond, even when I like. They, I think they should. Um, yeah. Any suggestions on how I approach that and trying to get that change across the line? Yeah, I mean, I think I I think that a lot of times we get we get caught up in the fact that we did, we just have a lot of stuff to do, right? We've got code to get out, we've got features to merge, we've got you know all of this development work that has to happen. And, and you tend not to think about the fact that there are people behind all of these contributions, right? So I think it can help to stress, 
to stress the fact that there are people who made these contributions and it's only polite to respond to them. So I think some of that is just reminding people that they need to be kind and empathetic. And by, by actually treating those people really well, then you can get them to continue to contribute in your community. If you just let their stuff go stale and never, nobody ever looks at it, they're not going to come back, right? Um, and I know etcd in particular has had a problem with uh, recruiter or retainment of contributors. And, and you do really, you need to treat people really well. And it's, um, it's hard, especially when, I mean, I, we get busy, right? And then we, we get short, we get, you know, we just try to get stuff done. And, and so I, I understand this, this problem. Um, it's something I think we all face. But you really do need to be, I think, kind and, and empathetic with, with these people and, and encourage them to come back. And you don't do that by just letting their stuff go stale and go away. Okay, one more round of applause for Dawn, please. Thank you. Thank you very much.